This year, to celebrate the launch of my fourth book, The Self-Sufficiency Garden, I thought I'd do a monthly series where we should explore seven of the core tasks that I would prioritize each month in terms of becoming as self-sufficient from my garden as possible. So these are just here to pose questions, thoughts, perhaps reminders, so you can feed your family as much tasty food as possible and also have as much fun out in the garden. The first task to do in February which is a really good one to do on a rainy day, of which there's a high likelihood this month, is to perform an audit of all of the seed packets that you have. You want to look at what's left over, how many have a useful quantity of seeds remaining, how many have maybe passed their best before sow date, just so you know what you currently have. And then you want to make sure that you get your seed order in. If you haven't done that yet, make sure this is your number one priority, which is why I'm saying it first. Even if you're not going to be sowing most of these seeds until April or May, you want to try and get your seed order in sooner rather than later, because some seed companies start to run out of stock of the best varieties. So make sure you get what you want to grow. If you want to eat a lot of fresh food over the hungry gap, which is an essential time during the self-sufficiency year, you want to make sure that you're collecting materials for making a hotbed. I usually make my hotbeds around mid-February, which is very, very soon. And so the, the focus for me this week is to gather the materials that I need. Mine are mainly going to be autumn leaves and seaweed. So I have the materials to make a hotbed. Hotbeds are one of the most productive and useful gardening methods out there. Not only do you get those early crops and you have plenty of time for succession planting during the rest of the year, you produce a huge volume of compost and it's also a place where you can germinate your tender seedlings by utilizing that bottom heat, which reduces your dependence on say electricity for heat mats or grow lights. You can, just, you can just start them off in a hotbed. You could make a smaller hotbed in a polytunnel a little closer to the growing season to help you with germinating all of those seeds. The next task is to identify if there are any perennial crops that should be growing in your garden that are currently not growing. The reason why you wanna prioritize this in February is not just because it's a dormant season and it's a good opportunity to plant them to guarantee success, but also in terms of cost saving. The, the cheapest way to buy these kind of plants is bare root. Because of shipping, you don't have to pay for the weight of, of the pot and all of the compost, and it is so much cheaper than a garden center. Garden center prices are absolutely ridiculous for the majority of soft fruit. And so look online for online retailers, look for the ones that sell them as bare root, the, the actual nurseries themselves, the growers, not the middlemen that are, that are putting a price on and get your orders in because there are such good deals out there but the thing about perennials is that they take you know two maybe three years depending on the perennial more if it's an apple tree to mature into full productivity so if you don't take that opportunity now you're going to end up becoming a year behind and every single year matters another nice task for a rainy day in february is to identify one particular skill set that you feel you could focus on improving this year that's going to contribute to your long-term success of self-sufficiency. So there's, there's so many skills that involve with self-sufficiency. It isn't just a case of like gardening and cooking. There's so many specific things that if you really dive into it, you can unlock so much potential. So one of the areas, of course, is how do you preserve all of the food that you're, that you're going to be growing? Well, one of the skills that you might want to look at becoming better at is perhaps fermentation. Fermentation is such a wonderful way of preserving your food, of preserving flavours that you can use throughout the year. Um, to get, to get flavours that you can't actually even buy because fermentation unlocks different tastes it is such a fun thing to do with your homegrown food. So Sam and I, we have a kitchen garden fermentation online course. I'll just put a link down below. So that's just an example of a skill that you could improve this year to help with self-sufficiency. Mine is to improve my skills when it comes to pruning tree fruit. We've got a lot of tree fruit here. My dad is an expert at pruning tree fruit and it's that kind of thing that I, I feel has been missing. And so that's my personal one. And I'd, I'd love to know, like have a think, what, what's one skill or area that you're gonna be focusing on this year? Because if you just focus on one skill area a year, that's gonna compound and really, really help over the long term. 
This tip kind of goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Just make sure that your garden is tidied, it's nice and neat. There's not too much time that we need to spend outside in February because it's still very, very early. So utilize that spare time just to get everything in order, nice and tidy, so we can start off in March on the front foot. Like psychologically, when you come into the garden, and it's tidy, it's a welcoming environment. If you have a welcoming environment, you're gonna to wanna to spend time there. Um, and so yeah, just, just tidy the garden, um, listen to a podcast, drink lots of coffee, bring a cake, easy. <laughs> One of the core skills for self-sufficiency is the skill of curiosity or, or the skill of experimentation and exploring. And so what I mean by this is, of course, there's different gardening methods to trial out. And I recommend you try them all yourself. That, that first-hand practical experience, once you've gone through it, you can kind of see if it's going to be particularly useful for you. It might not be useful for your neighbours, but your context, everyone's context is different. Everyone's needs are different. The thing that I, I always encourage is to trial every year, trial either new crops and new varieties that you've never grown before, but you feel might have specific characteristics that can help contribute to your self-sufficiency goals. And so one of the crops that I grew a couple of years ago, but it was, it was during that crazy drought, and we did get a little bit, but I thought, Hamlet, there's something there, was yakon. And so I've got some yakon growing tips that have just arrived, and I'm gonna be trying that properly this year as a proper trial. Uh, and two tomato varieties that I'm trialing are Lulu tomatoes, because they're big, massive tomatoes from the whale seed hub. And the seeds are on the outside, which makes it perfect for fermenting. And also from She Grows Veg, storage tomato. It's apparently this tomato that you can store uh, for months in the right conditions after harvesting, which sounds fantastic. So this year, trial at least three new crops, varieties, or a mixture of both in your garden that kind of make you wonder, hang on a minute, could this become a staple? Because that's the whole point with these trials. You want to find varieties and crops that you then know are going to be part of your garden every single year. They become dependable, they become part of your routine, and over time, your garden is going to become more and more productive because of this. For the seventh task, we're going to come back full circle to where we started. You've done the seed audit, you've got those varieties sorted. Now it's time to make a planting plan. The task that I would say, if you've already created your planting plan, chances are it's an annual one. You want to create a monthly planting plan for maximum productivity. It's the plan that I used for the self-sufficiency garden book. If you get the book, you can follow that plan and you can adjust it to your own garden. But a monthly planting plan allows you to have a lot more detail to make sure that you plan ahead for succession. I always think that a part of what makes a successful garden is a garden where, where the gardener feels in control of the process. And that's exactly what I feel when I follow a monthly planting plan. It just gives me the detail of things that I need to start off, that I need to transplant for next year. It helps me cover succession planting so I can maximize the amount of food that I'm growing in the garden. If you've never done a monthly planting plan before, then I have a video over here that I made fairly recently that just runs you through the basics. And if you're new to this channel, check out this video which shows you the story behind this self-sufficiency garden.